things so that everyone isn't an exceptional unicorn. I think that when we get to a place where a black and brown person can just be a regular person and, I don't know, be mediocre at best, we've gotten somewhere. <laughs> so anyway, on that note, uh, I'm really excited to bring up Kelly. She's going to talk to us about some really awesome laws of the land. So I started representing as many startups as I was entertainment clients. 
and I really liked it, and I felt I was being of service there. So, um, but at the same time, I still have to, you know, pay the bills, and you know, opening up your own business is scary, right? It's a risk. You know, people say, "Oh, I wish I could have your life," I'm like, it's not all trust me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot of work in it, and you, there's a trade-off, right? I have flexibility and whatnot, but the stability, you know, I don't know what I'm gonna get. You know, my next client say, Kelly, I have a copyright infringement case. Can you take it now? I'm like, well, yes, yeah, Friday night before Christmas, but sure. You know, um, but that's just my life. But getting there, um, you know, I, 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 it's definitely I can't go back. I think to my old life, but um, but but going back to you know having to do what you need to do um, so you can do what you want to do later. I had opened my own shingle, but because you know my clients and, and the caseload is not predictable. Um, I actually, I was, I was moderating a lot of panels, you know, being on panels, and one panel in March 2015 put on by my law school association in LA was on successful startups. And one of the founders that was on that panel that I was moderating, um, she was the CEO of a fashion tech company that I'm counsel of, general counsel and COO for two years, and then for the last three months I've been outside counsel so I can focus on my own business. But it was through just being out there. Like, there's a lot of things you can do online, but going to these things too, and not just black and brown things. Like, I'm actually hosting a panel, Women in Startups, for the Harvard Law School Association of New York City on the 18th. Like, come to that. Like, you don't have to be a graduate either. Just if you know one person, you just need to be in the room with people. And just, you just need to have your energy out there so people will know. Like you said, you know, you have to introduce yourself. But if you show up more and more places, you know, you, um, You'll, you'll eventually things will, will fall into place. And I bring up that story about the panel in 2015 is because the CEO was on that panel. Three months later, she, we had talked afterwards, and she said, oh, I want you to be you know, part of my, um, my uh, focus group uh, for this company. We re-engineered the Solano High Hill using rocket science and aerospace engineering. Yeah. Uh, the company's called Thesis Couture. Yeah. So, I, so that was in March when I met the CEO. And then, um, but we kept talking, I said, sure, I'll be in the focus group, you know, sounds good. Um, but then I had to join a corporate finance and real estate firm in LA because, you know, mother had to pay her bills. And so, literally in June of 2015, I was day three after a corporate law firm, like, kill me. I was so like, no, but, you know, you gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do. And then the CEO took me to lunch, he said, I need you to quit that job and join my company and come in house. Said, let me give me a day. <laughs> I crunched the numbers, and uh, I, I quit the firm. And then I was general counsel and CEO of the company, and I'm still counsel now, preparing for our series A. So just being, you said, just if you have a plan, stick with it, but also be open to different, you know, stage direction from the universe and whatnot. Um, so let me see here. Um, now to the super glamorous and fun world of law. Um, it's actually going to be, I know it's Monday morning and I don't want this to feel like we're in class even though we are in University City. Um, so let's see here. Okay, so I'm gonna go over three different subjects. Um, one is business formation. I mean, this is super simple, by the way, and this is very general, what I'm going over. This applies to small businesses and startups. Most of this is focused on startups. And can anyone tell me, like, what's the difference between startups and just regular businesses? Like, yes? Are startups free revenue? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, free revenue? I think, so just in terms of, I mean, it, Yes, so no, it could be pre-post, but a startup is essentially, so the difference is, you know, it's, it's designed to scale very quickly, like a company that's designed to grow. Not like a mom and pop, like they own their dry cleaners and they just own it and then they, they're the only ones who own it or maybe pass it down to the family or something like that. They're not looking to scale quickly, meaning that's why you have these rounds of funding so you can go like boom from you know, concept to research and design to prototypes to proof of concept to, you know, all those things. So that's the difference. So if you're, you need to figure out like, are you trying to start a startup or just a business? And both are obviously are okay, but that's how it's going to frame, you know, your decision making when you're going to a professional. Don't just rely on this. You need to go 
on all of my slides it'll say that please, please go to an advisor, accounting, tax, and legal, because everyone's situation, every single business is going to have a different answer. There is no one, yes, everyone should create an LLC. No. So just really generally here, um, uh, let me see. Uh, and be sure, by the way, to stick around for all the panels because there's going to be some overlap um, with speaking. You know, I'm doing very broad, or high level things, and people will go, like, I know our four o'clock um, panel, they're going to go into like equity and like dilution and what like, stuff like that. So, this is really general stuff. And I'm sure you guys all know so the types of business structures. So, you're saying, okay, I want to start my business. So, these are the basic kinds, right? Sole proprietorship, partnership, LLC. Um, Okay, so so prior, so it's easy, you know everything, but you share all the liability, right? Um, that probably is not going to. Be, I, I, you know, again, it depends on what business. You know, law office is a Kelly E. Shapiro sole proprietorship, you know, um, but partnership, two or more people, pros and cons, LLC, again, simple. You know, so but again, it all depends on what kind of business you're starting and where also in terms of people. So, well, where should I incorporate? Well, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Where are you doing it? Um, a corporation is, of course, the most typical startup structure. Um, you know, and we have different you know reasons why they have positives, a um, couple of couple cons. Um, I do have to say, with people, who, you know, they want to incorporate. They, they want to, um, you know, have this have this corporation, a business, but also when you get the protections and the benefits of um, incorporating or forming any kind of business, but specifically corporations, there are things that you have to do to to um, get the benefits of being a corporation. There's a, a legal concept called piercing the corporate veil. It's when some CEOs or businesses they're not really acting like a business, and so they're not keeping up with, you have to keep up with minutes, and a lot of it is self-auditing. So it's like, oh, no one's gonna check to see if I kept up minutes and stuff like that. It's like, well, if you do get audited, then the government can pierce that corporate veil and be like, actually, you were operating kind of like you were um, an individual, not really like a business, because you weren't taking care of all of the filings and the fees and all these things. So there is a lot of upkeep. You can't just like incorporate and then leave it, because so you're not gonna be protected. So that's the one thing, like when you're ready to incorporate, if that's your, you know, uh, uh, way to go, just be, just know that you, you're going to need to be on top of it, or either have a co-founder or whoever, a good accounting firm or whatnot, um, that can make sure you stay up to date with your periodic fi filings. Because the last thing you want is you have all these great investor meetings, and then they're like, you know, your um, status on the, you know, state website is revoked right now. Like that, investors don't want to see that, you know. So there's two different uh, type, biggest types of corporations, and again, that's more high level stuff. But you know, S corp versus C corp, and you can start as one and then you know revoke your status and become another one. But that's all basically taxation structure. Um, we can talk about that later if anyone has questions. Um, so why corporate? A lot of people kind of don't. It's like oh, I don't want to start paying fees, and I don't want to start having to do all these periodic filings, but. Um, like we heard in the first session, there are a lot of benefits on why you should actually form your business and just take it from the concept in your head or to your vision board and actually make it a business. So again, it's a lot of it is against uh, personal liability, attract investors, um, and protection, protection of your company and the individuals therein. Um, and then also to have your corporation own your intellectual property. That's, that's big. Um, you want to make sure everyone in the company has assigned their intellectual property to the company, and we'll talk about that a little later. Um, oops. So just th three main takeaways um, for each section, I'm going to say. So for this one, you know, form it as soon as you're ready. Um, why incorporate? Um, you know, just so you can operate your business. Um, and yeah, every situation is different, so please, please, please contact your local tax, accounting, and legal service providers. So two, um, equity. Fun, right? Yes? Okay, so types of shareholders. So this is, again, this is designed for startups, right? Not necessarily, we're not really gonna go into um, the regular businesses if, you know, you say, I'm just gonna get a loan from my uncle for you know 100k to or 10k uh, 
you know, whatever. That one, or you can just get a loan. And a lot of people also, I want to make sure people read what they write. I was so sad, this person who had um, started a, a small kind of creative company, and they um, were getting, having a lot of anxiety about this investor. They kept calling them an investor. And I said, are you sure it's an investor? And they sent me the documentation. I'm like, this is not an investment document. This is a promissory note. This, that was a loan. It was not an investment. So please understand what, you know, people are looking at you for an opportunity as well. So really understand what kind of um, investor you're getting, or is it just a friends and family loan, or is it just a straight up loan from a bank or whatever. Um, but for equity for this situation, we're just talking about the private startups. Um, and these are, again, just basic um, terms. So when you start up with the startup, um, you have founder stock, right? And then you have investors, and these are the two biggest kinds. We can talk about, you know, um, crowdfunding and, you know, those kinds of things. But the biggest two buckets are angel investors. You hear about that, like, who's an angel? Don't they sound so ethereal and, like, wonderful? No, it's just a really rich person who can, or, yeah, I consider that rich if you just have, you know, like half a mil in the bank just ready to, you know, to deploy, um, you know, who likes your idea and wants to invest in you. Um, I do have to say, be cautious about angel investors who are not used to investing in tech or startups because it's very high risk. And a lot of people who are used to investing in things like real estate, they can't get the concept that this may not work out and all your money is gone. So a lot, so you have to have a very high tolerance of risk to be an angel investor or just have a lot of money and be like, oh, it's an expensive mistake. Um, so angel investors are one, and then venture capital, you know, when people talk about VCs, venture capital, um, you know, a lot of people don't really understand what it is. So it's just, it, it's, I feel like it sounds like such a complicated concept, but it really is just, you know, again, it's a, it's a fund of, of money pulled from other investors. So when you break it down, it's not, I don't think as complicated as sometimes we make it seem. And then the third type of shareholder are employees. Um, and yeah, stock options are grants, and then um, of course, I hope we all know that most um, grants of stock, or especially for employees, advisors, is going to be, you don't immediately get st stock, but that's another mistake I've seen founders make, is they think they're giving out stock to, you know, this new, um, you know, member of our advisory board, you got to give them something, or I can't pay this developer, so I'm going to give them stock. They like, okay, but it's, it's on a five-year vesting schedule. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let me see the doc. Like, where's the vesting schedule? Oh, it's, I, oh, they never signed that. It's like, well, you granted them stock then, and they it immediately vested. So you have to do it together. So maybe that's why, again, you gotta see the professionals. To, you know, you could try to do it on your own, but there's so many little things that you have to remember, um, specifically with vesting. And everyone knows what vesting schedules is, are, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so you earn your stock, you don't immediately get it, so people don't just bounce, you know, it's like, great, I have. 100,000 shares of Facebook stock, I believe. Um, so, rounds of funding, and again, this is just for startup companies, really the ones that need to scale quickly. Um, so you, and again, these are just usual. So seed stage, you guys hear that a lot, you know, it's usually very early on. Um, and usually angel, angel investors talking about VCs, accelerators, incubators, you know, they'll inject maybe some capital in exchange for some equity in your company. Um, and then, so the second round typically can be um, uh, venture capital rounds. That's when you hear like the Series A and they, you know, their Series B, and that's where more instit institutional investors come around. Um, and then three, the initial public offering. And people say like, why do you go public? Like it's such a, you know, a term like, oh, you know, Snapchat's going public, SoulCycle is going public. Like, what? It's really just to raise more money for their company and also to make the venture capitals. The capitalists and the people who have invested thus far, they can actually see a return on their investment. So, um, but again, these are very general, big uh, concepts, and we can talk about it more later. Oops. And so, equity three takeaways. Um, yeah, pay close attention. Like, sit down and read all the documents. It's, I never, I, I see it all the time when founders they really don't understand what they are signing and they will say what they think is in their documents and it's completely contrary. So please just, you know, be patient and if you don't understand what you're reading, um, ask somebody and don't be afraid um, at all. So, oh, the number, the best things schedules are very important. And then three, um, not all money is good money. 
I have to say, you know, right now I'm co-founder of a medical device accessory startup for my rapper client in Queens and then a financial friend in LA. They both share the same kind of story and passion for this one product and I kind of the glue that brought it together. But now we're deciding what kind of, uh, how do we want to fund this? Because you know, if we choose to take an investors, they have to be strategic. Who's going to get us to the next level? Whose network do we want to get in? Just, you know, I've seen angel investors, people are just like, ooh, $100,000 check? Yeah, I'll take that. I'm like, yeah, but now you just have this person who just likes to opine all the time about your operations and they don't know anything about what you're doing, but they feel entitled, as they should, because they put in 100K. But, you're, but then, meanwhile, you didn't take in a great fund like, Backstage Capital, Arlen speaking later. I love Backstage Capital. Um, you know, or Built by Girls, they specifically invest in um, startups founded by women. They're based out of uh, New York City. Uh, they're both uh, investors in the fashion tech company. Um, but I push for us to have Backstage, because I'm like, no, Backstage, first of all, I just love what they're doing, but it's, it's the networks and the strategic partnerships you can leverage through your investors. So just, um, you know, I know it's hard to say no to money, but it's actually a good thing. Um, so three, IP on time. So when you're starting your company, and it doesn't matter again if it's a small business or if you are, you know, a startup and you think you're going to go down the, the the path of raising um, capital through VCs or angels or you know whatever the case may be, um, you know you really need to start building that portfolio because you know that's going to be one of your biggest points of value for your company um, and just you need to make sure that everything is assigned to the company and that's you know going back to the first part why the company has to be its own thing so that company can own it not one individual um, because that again that just it's kind of common sense but you need the company not an individual a company to grow in value and so everyone needs to uh, to assign their IP, and that means anything. If you're just, you know, one of your graphic designers or something, could come up with an amazing, you know, suggestion for this or that of the product. Yeah, but when they signed up for their, you know, on their advisor or, or contractor or employee agreement, they you always have that um, assignment of intellectual property, just so you know there's no break in the chain of title of IP. That no, it all goes back to the company always because investors, again, um, are going to say, or partners, or whoever it's going to be, and be like, well, do you even own your IP, or should I actually go, you know, get it from the person who actually does own it, you know, to whatever it is. It could be to, if you have an app, or if you just, you know, there's a lot of value in the brand. You know, for the fashion tech company, yeah, there's a patent in our inter in internal architecture, but there's also value in the brand that we are building as well. Um, so that means the trademark, and, um, you know, just, uh, you know different um, different things there, but uh, and copyrights in various you know uh, things as well. So um, and it's really cheap too. It's not as expensive as people think. Like even for trademarks, patents of course are going to be a bit more. But you know you can also find great law firms that I have many recommendations that will work with you too. That specifically um, will counsel um, startups and work with you. You know different payment structures, or they can do um, you know work on equity. I've definitely seen that. There's different um, law firms that will work on equity. Um, and then you can kind of have like a credit, like of, you know, I don't know, hundred thousand dollars worth of legal services in exchange for equity or something like that. Um, so takeaways, own it, increase value. Yeah, and do the due diligence, please. I really hate it too when people are so just so married to whatever concept they have or this idea or a name. And then it's like, well, did you do a search to see if this was already out there? And they do all this work, and then they find out, like, oh, I can't use that name. Or, and by the way, that's not the end of the story. Everything's negotiable. So even if someone does have what you want, you know, give them, you never know. You can give them a call and like, are you even using this anymore? Can I just buy it off you for 500 bucks? You know? So don't quit, but try to do as much due diligence on the front end so you're not then burned uh, on the back end. And yeah, I think that's about it. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> How do you uh, actually go about, say you develop something and you're 
Mm. Okay, cool. So the same, um, you partner with people, and yes. you, they bring their own IP to it, right? Mm -hmm. To build a player foundation for a platform. However, you come on top of that with your own intellectual property um, to create something completely brand new. Um, how do you navigate that from an IP standpoint? Well, you have a nice little meeting with your legal team, right? And you would just sit and see what, you know, first of all, I, well, this is a case by case, like I said, I don't really know exactly what you're talking about, but if they can come, I mean, I would already think that both sides would want to work together to build something really big, right? right? Yeah. So I would think we're coming from a place of, you know, collaboration, so I don't see there'd be much contention there, but there's a way if they want to assign it over to the company, I mean, so instead of it just being two people talking about their various intellectual property, it's like the company and then someone else bringing their IP that I guess can add to the company's IP, I guess? Is that what you're saying? Right, well, so essentially, um, I developed a platform. However, uh, we have programming partners who came with some technology um, to help make that happen. But it's all of our ideas, it's all of our applications, everything else, they just kind of have this kind of, the actual technology itself, they came to the table with that already. Well, well, I would think that in your discussions with them, they're going to say what they, like, if they want to withhold 100% ownership of that or not, or if they want to license it out to you. You know, so I mean, that's a discussion you have to have with them. I don't know what they're going to say. So, yeah, that's just an adult conversation you're going to have to have early, you know, and really, and also put this on paper. You're going to have that. For sure, get an IP expert, a patent attorney, um, who can say, you know, analyze, you know, what they own, what they're bringing to the table, and then, yeah, what it's really what they want to do, though. Like, if they own it and you need it, so are we going to work this out as a license, or can you assign it all and then the company owns it? I mean, I don't know. It's up to you guys. So, yeah. So I have a question about um, business formation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering how you determine when it's too early, or in your opinion, how do you determine when it's time to do that type of work? Um, so I would think, you know, are you ready to do business, right? So like for the, the startup that I'm, I'm with my Rapper, you guys know who Farrah Lange is, Simon says? Yeah. That's my client, thank you. And the medical device accessory space. I like to transition my artists from music world, because not a lot of money in the music business, into the VC and startup world. It's amazing. So anywho, with that, you know, I was talking to Farrah, I was talking to my other co-founder, Chris, it's like, you know, we're all been around the block. Chris, my other co-founder, is the president of a bank. I've been a lawyer for 12 years. We know what we're doing, but we're we're gonna, you know, when we decided when to form our business, like, first of all, we need to decide on a name. You know, things like, seriously, things like that. We have all these business models and stuff, but we still have a name. So things like that, because I said, okay, guys, I'm ready to create our company, but do we decide on a name? Yeah, things like that. It's like, when do we need to actually start the company? When are, are we are going to, are we about to start actually taking in funds? Either self-funded, right? So you need to start that business so then you can set up a bank account, you know, get an EIN, do all those things, start building your portfolio of IP, because once it's named, I came up with a name, and I think we should use mine. But that will be our first real um, um, piece of IP. So it, it's, it, but you got to make sure is the name available, all those things. So we're ready because, okay, we've done this, we've done the modeling, we have our first prototype, we do this, we pick the name, we know where, right, are we a startup, right? Or are we just going to have a business and just offer, no, so okay, so we're startup, so we should probably incorporate in Delaware and the state, okay. You know, so you need to check off these certain boxes that you're ready to form a business, and again, be ready to start acting like a business. 
so so it's not just dormant and then you know it expires and whatnot. So it depends on you. Like when are you ready to kick it off? I mean, maybe you need to start it so that'll be like a kick in the pants or something. But there is no real um, one answer of when. It's really when when you're you're ready. Sorry, did I answer? I I can't tell you basically. <laughs> Thank you so much for sure. uh, your information on structure. Mm -hmm. uh, as we know, though, lots of people ignore this for yeah. a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I know a situation where there are two partners, two students, uh, decided to start a startup. One put all, all the money in, and the other did the work. And now, Sweat equity. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so the one who did the work now says, since I did the work, I own the IP, and sorry, I'm not giving your money back. Do you have any recommendations for how to resolve those kinds of things? Those are friends? Not anymore. I don't <laughs> like friends. <laughs> I'd say, what did they agree to in the beginning? What's in writing? 50-50 what? Okay, so how do they get IP goes to 100% to the sweat equity person? So I always go back, you know, I never have to take any of the blame for, you know, her said, like, look at the document. If the document says it, I'm not saying it. It's what the document says. So that's the problem they didn't talk about. I just said, what did the document say? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you know, error number one. You've got to document it for these very reasons, right? Or the document it properly about, oh, no, I thought this employee, you know, they're going to leave me and they're taking so much of my stock. I was like, well, I thought he was on a five-year vest. You're fine. They left after, oh, I didn't uh, sign the thing. It's like, well, so I don't know what to tell you. It's the document. It's what you signed. So for that, um, uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, they're going to have to battle it out. I mean, sadly, they really are. If it, that's what happens, though, when you don't document things properly in the beginning, and then, you know, I'm all about preventative medicine, you know, so you can avoid getting this kind of sick. This, oh, that's unfortunate, but they'll get through it. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Presentation. Thank you. I'm Camille. I'm the founder of Pop Up Plus, and we're an online travel plus size girl. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, my question is How do you find legal representation for your startup? I've had maybe one or two, and it has not been a positive experience. And I'm in New York, and I feel like everybody's a startup. A tech company or something. So, mm -hmm. what is your advice for finding great representation and someone who really will take the time to work with you for minimal cost? I know that's a lot to ask. And secondly, how do you deal with um, someone like internationally who's infringing on company um, IP? Um, like right now, just to give you an example, we have someone in Africa using our name, and we try to be polite, and that's not really. Helpful. Yeah. Well, the first one is, um, you know, you have to, it's kind of like finding a doctor. I think you got to figure out who you work well with. When people ask me for a legal representation, that recommendation for whatever it is, family law, startup law, you know, whatever, um, I always give, try to give them three names. Talk to all three, see which ones you vibe with, and also who you can work with financially. Like, what structure? Are they on contingency? Are they hourly? Can you do an equity situation? But you want to work some, with someone who will grow with you. Like, all my clients, I, I like them a lot. Like, the one thing that's different with my practice now versus when I was just in corporate law, you know, I didn't, yeah, I wasn't super uh, in love and fired up every day, you know, schlepping off to do, you know, some big deal of securitization for, you know, big billionaire big thing. But, you know, I let love for my clients. I represent CommieHype.com as a Commie uh, network for black millennials. I love growing with them. And so they'll just keep me apprised of what they're going on. If they're raising more funding or, hey, we need to get this partner on, this partner off. They just keep me apprised. But they found me organically. They knew I was a comedy nerd. They saw that I represented some comics and stuff. So organically, they reached out to me. It's like, you seem to know our world, and you seem great. And then I work with them. They, you know, I, I 
have very flexible, you know, um, billing structures and whatnot, but if it's the right fit, they'll, that lawyer will work with you, and that'll really be your advisor, and it'll grow, you know, into more of just strictly, you know, just being a billable hour, that was one thing that was killing me, is like all the clients are just a billable hour, and I, I don't like to kind of live like that, so you just gotta find the right lawyer for you, and I think, are you gonna be in New York on October 18th? Come to my panel, you'll meet zillions of lawyers there. Yeah, we have great panels, um, three women of color, they're all, the former um, GC of Rent the Runway is gonna be on the panel, yes. I'll be on the panel, um, uh, the founder of the Entrepreneur's Legal Clinic at um, Fordham is gonna be on the panel, and it's just gonna be, you know, silly with lawyers there, you'll find like plenty of them there. That will work with you, and, and find someone also that believes in your cause and is with it, just like me being, uh, GC of thesis and tours because I said, oh, I'm down with that company. You know, I can wear heels like all day long and I have to, you know, transition to class. I'm in. So I believed in the company and I was willing to take that cut in pay and grow with also the equity stay. So you can work with it. But you got to go to, you know, go where the lawyers are. <laughs> um, it's women in startups and it's on, um, just Meet me on my website, and then I'll send you the invitation when I think it's coming out today. Um, but yeah, that's on the 18th in New York. Um, and so the second one, so with international infringers, it's tough, right? Especially so the company I'm working on now with, with Pharaoh, it's like, um, you know, we know, or even the fashion tech company, we know as soon as we come out on the market, you know, you're gonna start having counterfeiters, right? People are gonna rip apart shoes and try to, you know, recreate it or think I'm dealing with barrel. They're immediately gonna try to, especially in, uh, in China and whatnot. So the strength of your IP, of course, make sure it's extremely strong in, uh, in America. And you can do your inter international um, IP work, but you're just gonna have to come to, you know, you, you can go after them, right? But you just have to, it's a cost benefit analysis too. How much you know, good money do you want to throw after that kind of thing? Are they really taking away a lot of your customers? Um, and see, is it worth it? Because you're gonna, I mean, that's also a kind of a compliment that they're copying it, right? So um, I think, you know, first you gotta deal with the first question and they'll help you with the second. <laughs> right, you're welcome. Hi, I'm over here. I'm Loli. Hi, how are you? Good. I'm Lolita Walker. I am the founder of Walker and Walker Enterprises, which is a change management consultancy to help individuals and organizations really transition through change successfully. I started it as an LLC. So I've been getting some coaching to really elect as an escort, but I'm really kind of struggling with whether or not I see the limits now because it is in startup mode. Um, although I can really see where it's going to go. So I just wanted some thoughts from you on what are maybe like two pros and then two cons I should really just watch out for before I make the decision. To go from LLC to an escort? To, yeah, to elect as an escort. Yeah. yeah. And then, after that even, you know, there are different, you know, that's more technical too because, um, you know, Electing for the S Corp, then you may have to do a relocation of the S Corp. You want yeah. to do C Corp. You know, it's all, it, it's it's really comes down to tax questions. Yeah. It really does. It's, it's, you know, you need to sit down with your accountant and with your partners and decide, you know, what your, what your plan is. Um, I would think if you're going towards that startup mode that you're going to have to, you know, go into the incorporation uh, kind of phase. But I think you should sit down with your advisors and, and, and talk about it. Um, but we can talk afterwards too. But it's, it's a very individualized answer, I think, for you. All right, We can do one more question. I'm going to let Kelly choose. I can't do it. He's had his hand up to play at the beginning. The hat? Okay, yes, that was. You do the start of Um, I think I think NDAs and confidentiality. I definitely think you should have people and just send it quickly on DocuSign. Like, oh, I just popped it over on DocuSign. Can you sign that real quick? Just make it. Just make sure everyone's on the same page. Even if you know a lot of people, you know, NDAs are hard to enforce in California and whatnot. But still, having people sign NDAs. 
treat every com uh, every conversation confidentially because people also everyone likes to gossip, which is a shame. But you know, be careful about who you talk to. You know, your ideas about. Um, you know, so I think the NDA. I send people NDAs. We're, I'm we're talking to manufacturers this week. And I always give them the NDA first before I think about it. Certainly not sending you any files or the pictures before you send an NDA. Um, but at the same time, when you're talking to like money people a lot, you know, you don't want to also turn people off. And it's also counterintuitive. It's like you do want to share enough that they can make an informed decision. Um, so I think it's just a balancing act. You should use NDAs when you can. Um, you know, especially with anything regarding intellectual property and stuff, but just talking about basic concepts, um, you know, should be okay. But again, it's a, it's a, it's a case, 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 case. Actually, we moved all that up. I've always had a practice in Philadelphia since 2005, I think. And where's the movie? So it's not brick and mortar or virtual office. <laughs> But no, the dream is one day. Right now I'm just LA New York City, because that's where most of my clients are, but my first and, and favorite will always be Philadelphia. Yeah, I'm always Philadelphia. You're welcome. All right. Enjoy the rest of the some food still here in the back. We are going to be refreshing the coffee and tea with some hotter temperature coffee and tea shortly. Um, but there is still plenty of snacks. There's a bottle of water. And we are going to reconvene in 10 minutes.
OBS, so they have different like they have a uh, like wirecast, which is something which is the switcher. So if you're gonna be broadcasting, you need a switcher to show which type of video. So like this, I'll go, I can go here and pick like, all right, I need the intro slide versus the commercial that I have running right now. So I can pick what you see. I can have different screens on there, and that's a free software. So it's pretty limited, but that's the that's what the free one does. Now, once you start paying for it, it costs a nice a nice little bit of money. But like this is a great software.
from firms like Capor Capital, 500 Startups, and Magic K12. I've also leveraged this secret language to speak on over 65 stages over the last six years in Silicon Valley. I've leveraged it to write over 100 articles, and some of those articles have been featured on forums, LinkedIn, as in Medium, as some of the best pieces of the year. I've also leveraged the secret language to sit down with some of the biggest players and influencers in Silicon Valley, the founders and investors who are making this industry go round. And lastly, I've leveraged the secret language to now teach it to over 20 founders from around the country, teaching them everything I know so they can benefit from this secret language. And what is it? It's empathy. Any attention? You think you may know, but you don't know. Empathy is the ability to experience the world from another's perspective. It requires that you stop taking selfies and focusing on yourself, and you flip that camera around and start focusing on the other person. It requires that you put yourself in someone else's shoes. Sometimes that means literally, but more times I'm talking about figuratively. There are three types of people that every founder needs to have empathy for. The first one is the customer. The person you are trying to get to buy your product or service. If you don't speak the secret language to the customer, it doesn't matter anything else you do, this is by far the most important thing. Thereafter, the teammates. You need to empathize with your teammates, and as Kelly was just talking about, your funders. You need to empathize with the people who are investing capital into your venture. If you don't have empathy for the customer, the teammate, or the funder, you cannot speak their language, and you miss the opportunity to engage them. So when I was asking you the questions at the beginning, Who's tried to sell something and failed? Who's tried to recruit and failed? Who's tried to pitch and it failed? More than likely, you weren't speaking their language. So, you can build the most beautiful app, the most beautiful website, you can have the nicest landing page, but if you don't speak their language, it's going to fail. You can have the most beautiful office and all the nice perks, but if you're not speaking the language that matters to your teammates, you are going to lose them or not be able to recruit them at all. And of course, if you are also trying to, uh, if you're sending a thousand emails to a thousand investors and you're not getting any responses or you're getting no after no after no, it's more than likely that you're not speaking their language. All right, so what I'm going to ask you guys to do is take a little dip in the spa. Taking a dip in the spa means deciding, investigating, profiling, assessing stranger danger, planning, and acting. First thing you have to decide is which person are you going after? This is your customer. Which person are you going after? This is your teammate. Which person are you going after? This is your funder. Who exactly are you trying to target? I like I told you, I work with many founders, and one of them in particular is trying to go after black women in terms of who she's trying to sell to. Well, there's many different types of black women. There's Kamala Harris's of the world, there's the Michelle Obama's, there's the Issa's, there's the Mary Jane's. Which type of black women are you trying to appeal to? You have to get granular and make sure you can speak their language. The second thing you have to do is you have to get your CIA on. You have to investigate these people. And there's three main ways to investigate. Make observations, meaning you don't affect their environment. All you do is you get a little creeper status and you just start watching them. You start seeing how they dress, what they say, what they're doing, who they're hanging out with, what they're not saying. You make observations. Second option, you have conversations. Sit down with them, ask them questions, get to know them. Be careful not to ask biased questions where you're trying to lead them into an answer that affirms what you already believe. Questioning is very important in making sure you're asking objective questions. And then lastly, if you don't have access to the people you're trying to get to, 
right? Send surveys. There's other ways in which you can do this. And social media makes it so easy now. How many people in here know that you can do a poll on Instagram? On an Instagram story, you can do a quick poll. How many people know you can do a poll on Twitter? On Facebook, leverage these opportunities to learn more about the people you're trying to target. Next up, in the dip the small, you have to profile the person. So you've decided who you're going after, you've put your CIA hat on, and you've gotten some information about them, now it's time to create their profile. So for instance, if we're focusing on Issa, Issa's in her late 20s, she's female, single, no children, lives in Inglewood, she's a youth liaison at a nonprofit called We Got Gotcha. Um, she makes 60K annual income, the bachelor's degree from UCLA. Other things about Issa, her goal, she wants to help others be a good person and find happiness. She also wants to have it, a lit quotation. She values friendship, quote, I actually give lots of, tons of them, I'm a prostitute of feelings. The reason why it's important to quote these people because you get a sense of their personality, right? And you can start learning their language, right? Would Mary Jane say that? Probably not, right? So this is why you have to go granular and really understand each person's language. Beyond the categories I was just sharing, there are other things that you need to profile about the person, and this becomes a customer avatar. If you have not done a customer avatar yet, but you are building a business, you've missed the most important step. You're gonna have to stop, go back to the fundamentals, learn about the people you're trying to target, build out their customer avatar. So in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll notice sources of information, like books, magazines, blogs. You're like, well, why do I need to know what they're reading? Because this is your distribution channel. This is how you're going to connect with them. Maybe you want to run an advertisement on those magazines. Maybe you want to publish an article there because you know Issa Rae is going to be there and that's your target. So again, you need to take the time to profile and map out who your customers, who your teammates, even who your funders are. Do this for an investor and you will start learning their language. All right. Next one, we're getting to the spa. Stranger danger. It is incredibly mind-boggling. And I may have done this too, but it's incredibly mind-boggling how we forget common courtesy and that oftentimes we may ask of strangers we don't even know. And from the other person's perspective that you're trying to get the attention of, they're like, who are you? Uh, why should I be helping you? Why should I stop everything I'm doing? To support you, you have to understand that more than likely you're going to be a stranger to people first and foremost. And it's your job to identify that and realize you're going to have to put in some work to build trust, to build rapport with people before you make an ask. Okay? I get emails all the time, yeah, you can do this, you do that, you do this. And I promise you, nobody is waiting around. Uh, to, to be asked something or to be sold someone at something. Nobody is. Imagine someone coming and knocking on your door at home. Boom, boom, boom. And being like, hi, I'm going to do that. And I'm doing this and that. Can you do this for me? And you're like, whoa, I don't know you. Right? But we do it all the time. Recognize you're a stranger. You have to build rapport first before you make an ask. Alright. Right? The final two. Plan. Alright? I can tell you all this stuff, but if you don't make it into a strategic plan, you're not going to get anywhere. So here's a few common problems with emails that oftentimes happen. The subject line looks like a trap, okay? <laughs> Meaning, right, if you don't have a good subject line, you have no chance of getting that person's attention. No way they're going to open that. Emails are flooded with spam, all sorts of stuff. So in order to break through that, you have to have a better subject line. So a current piece of advice is, is there a microphone? Sorry, there's sound coming through, it threw me off. It's like, is my subconscious talking? <laughs> like, that's so weird. Okay, uh, subject line looks like a trap. So a technique you may want to use that I use oftentimes is I try to find commonality, right? Because commonality builds trust. When, be, when you have something in common with someone, they're more apt to listen to you. There's already a connection. 
So for instance, if I don't know somebody personally, I go on LinkedIn and I try to find out who we know in common. And I will put that in the subject line. I'm like, hey, Daryl, I know page two. And he's like, oh, who's this, right? So again, leverage commonality. There's a second tactic I use called recognition. Recognition is when you stroke somebody's ego. You tell them how amazing they are, how wonderful you thought their latest article was, what you think about their amazing investment firm, stroking their ego. And then the third one is inspiration. Everybody wants to be inspired. What are you doing? that ties to what they care about that they can get inspired by, okay? But you guys need to work on those subject lines, okay? Because otherwise, it's not even getting through. Self-centered, it's too self-centered, meaning it's all about you, 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 you. And again, remember, speaking their language means speaking to what they care about. Inauthenticity, people can smell bullshit a mile away, okay? They can, I know you can smell it too, right? You know, you can, smells like bullshit, okay? <laughs> Don't be on the other end of that, okay? You need to be authentic. People will care about you once you start caring about them, okay? Too long, oh my gosh. I don't know about you, but nobody's waiting around. Waiting to open an email, that's a book, okay? Keep it short. Anything more than a paragraph or two, you, you're gone, okay? Keep it short, keep it brief. Boring. Again, people, you have to use some, you have to understand we're living in the ADD, ADHD, instant stimuli generation where people are so used to infotainment that you have to add a little jazz to what you're putting out there to get people interested. Not relevant means why are you telling me about something that I am not related to or I don't care about? And if you did research on me, you would have known that, right? You shouldn't be coming to me, you should be coming to someone else. And then no call to action. Have an ask in there. Closed mouths don't get fed. What do you want? By when do you want it? Okay? Be specific. Do you want me to look at your whole deck or do you want me to look at slide five and tell you about your product roadmap? Right? Be specific because when you don't do these things, you disrespect people's time. And nobody likes to have their time disrespected. So it's your job again to do your homework up front. Another thing when you're planning, thinking not just about your content, but think about your strategy and how many touch points you're going to make to this person so that you consistently try to get your message out to them. Because the first email may not work. I have a rule that says three by three. I will email someone three times before I let it die for a little bit, and I will email them every three days. So day one, I'm like, hi, blah, 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 blah. They don't respond, I give them three days, I send them another one, they don't respond, I wait three days, I send them another one. But on the last time, they don't respond, I always got a little trick up my sleeve. And in my subject line, I put, hi, Jim, is everything okay? Question mark. And I put, oh, I just wanted to make sure that, that everything was okay. I've been reaching out to you. And that's it. It's just two lines. Every time I get a response. Because what you do is you make the other person feel guilty. Okay? So you let them look guilty. It's a little pro tip. Every time it works. But in general, you just need to recognize that it's not just a one-time attempt. Getting someone's attention, you have to do it a couple times. And notice here, there are two promotions, meaning two opportunities to sell. But there are many touch points throughout that. The reason for that is that people don't want to be sold. They want to be helped. People don't want to be sold. They want to be helped. So provide value, 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 value. I'm going to sneak in and ask. Value, 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 value. I'm going to sneak in and ask. Okay? Help them first before you ask them for something. And then lastly, and most importantly, act founders. Act. You are getting so much information today later on this afternoon, if it goes and dies in your little notebooks to collect dust and I don't see you applying them, you get an F in foundership, okay? It's all about putting this into action. So today when you email someone, stop and think and ask, am I speaking their language? And if you don't know what their language is, go back to the CIA step and investigate who these people are because you're wasting opportunities when you're sending things that are landing on deaf ears. All right, so now we're going to rewind. We're going to rewind. Come on, people. Uh uh. We're going to rewind. Let's go rewind. Rewind. Don't be so stiff. Come on. 
So rewind in terms of what did I just teach you? All right, let's make sure we were paying attention. Remember, taking a dip in the sea means deciding, deciding who you're going after. Are you going after Michelle Obama? Are you going after Kamala Harris? Are you going after Issa Rae? Are you going after Mary Jane? Are you going after Mandela? Are you going after Ania? Who are you going after exactly? Step two, investigate. You should know everything about me if you're trying to sell me, everything. You can find all this information online. Go to my Facebook, go to my Instagram, go to my Medium post, see what I write about. You should be using that to learn my language. Profile, create a profile of me. I know it's kind of creepy if I find it, but create one, you should have it. Stranger danger, recognize how well do I know you? Are you 20 degrees away from me? Are you five degrees? However far away from you, uh, from however far you are away from someone else, oh, that's a tongue twister, you have to work that much harder to get closer to that person and build trust. And how I oftentimes do it is my LinkedIn trick. I'll go on and try to find somebody I know, and that'll be my entree into getting the person's attention. You all have that tool. Plan, most importantly, act. Okay, empathy is the ability to see the world from another's perspective. I found this makeup artist, and I thought it was a wonderful analogy for what I'm trying to tell you guys, about before you go out and try and start selling your customers, selling the talent to join your team, selling investors, put yourself in their shoes. Now, you don't have to literally dress up as them, but you figuratively need to become that person so that you can understand how to navigate their language. It's the language of success, and if you master this, you will build the right product that people use. You will recruit the talent that is so excited to join your team, even if you don't have money to pay them. I've done it many times. If you master the language of investors, when you email them, they will respond. If you master empathy, you can master people. And if you can master people, you can master business. This could be you. This could be you in the spa. With Obama. With Oprah. If you don't know this guy, that's Brian Chesky, the CEO and founder of Airbnb. One of the fastest growing startups of the last five years. Okay? That could be you in the spa of success if you actually act and apply what I just taught you. Other things you can do, I've written a lot about this. So if you want to take a screenshot or whatever, a picture, these are where you can read more about exactly what I'm talking about. What do you say to people? What should you write? I have lists and examples so that you can leverage it even after this talk. So I'll give you about five seconds. Come on, gotta be fast, gotta be fast. Be fast, and we're gone. Other things you can do to dive deeper, a lot of this stuff is not new. This is a lot of other principles, starting with this guy, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Book changed my life. Anybody else read it? Okay, anybody else read it more than once? All right, you need to read it at least once, and I keep it by my bedside. Always remember, it's not about me, it's about the other person. Other more common frames of this are in Simon Sinek's TED Talk. If you haven't listened to this, start with why. Highly recommend it. Design thinking, there's a whole school at Stanford about this, called design thinking. Gary V, he has a great analogy, he says, what is it called? Uh, jab, 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 right hook. Every jab is where you're providing value to someone. A hook is the ask. You never make the hook without providing value, providing value, providing value. So remember this, when you're trying to form a relationship with someone you don't know, give them something before you take from them. Um, and then last thing, oh, Master the Scales, the new podcast, there's an episode in particular I would love you to listen to. It's with Brian Chesky, that white guy I showed you in the previous spa with the mom and, 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 and Oprah. But Brian Chesky has an episode where he talks literally how he leveraged this to build Airbnb to what it is today. It's super inspirational. All right. Lastly, I'll leave you with this. We have two ears and one mouth so that we can listen twice as much as we speak. Founders, we're good at talking, aren't we? We're talking good game. We got all sorts of ideas and all sorts of things we want to do. Stop. Check yourself. Be humble. Realize that you don't know anything. And that in order for you to win this game, you have to stop and learn the language of other people. So how was this? Up, down? Okay, okay. But yeah, um, this Friday I'm going to be
be offering only to this group a 60-minute free virtual coaching session. I'm going to present some more in-depth material, but specifically for funding. It doesn't matter if you're a nonprofit and you want to get foundations, I've done that. If you are a uh, for-profit and you're looking for government grants, if you are a startup and you're looking for investment, um, all of these are options for you. And three people. I'm picking three people who sign up, and you're going to get a one-on-one -on -one session with me for free. So three people, where do you sign up? Right here. So take a screenshot of that, our picture. You must sign up in order to qualify for group coaching. And then again, I'm going to pick three people. That's it. I'm sorry. So I got time for um, to participate. It's just bit.ly. I want funding. All right, and that's it. This is where you can find me. My Twitter, my email, and again, I'll be looking at those emails. Awesome. See if you've learned my language. You're looking at Q and A now. Okay, a little Q and A. Can I get a round of applause, maybe? Oh. So uh, I really like your approach uh, to doing the background research on the people you're trying to engage with, but in the myriad of the 10,000 other things you have to get done, how much time do you think you should spend getting to know someone as you're making an approach or before you make an approach? Is this in relation to customers, teammates, or funders? All of the above. Okay, so teammates don't matter if you don't have customers, funders don't matter if you don't have customers. So the most important thing is the user and the customer because that is when you actually have some sort of tangible data that you're on the verge of product market fit. And if you don't have customers or users, none of, it else, none of, none of the rest matters. So you need to spend as much time as you need on your user who you turn into your customer uh, before you do anything else. Because oftentimes people are pitching investors and the investor's like, well, where are your users? And you're like, oh, I had 10 last month. And we're like, okay, what are your users today? Oh, they're 15. Okay, how many of them are staying around, right? Because it's one thing to get people to your platform. It's a totally different ballgame to get them to stay. So you need to spend as much time as you need on customer development. So for, for instance, even I'm building out a new product right now. I'm doing all this customer research. I'm spending a minimum of a month just doing research. Because again, we're so busy, we're so like anxious to get ahead and to get started. But if you don't get that first piece right, nothing else matters. It'll fall. It will. Yeah. Uh, so, Claire, hey, uh, my question is: in your coaching uh, business, for for your ideal clients, how many? Are in your programs ideally, and what's your actual customer habits are? Uh, Ten people are in my uh, cohort one at a time, but I have two cohorts overlapping, so I'm able to manage basically 20 founders at a time myself. And so my customer avatar, I have three. So I have the person who um, I call them the beginner, meaning that they've decided to be an entrepreneur, but they haven't actually built anything yet. But they made a decision. That's a big part. The second person I call the part timer without a product meaning that they decided to become a founder, they're in the process of building a product, but they haven't launched yet. And then the third avatar is the part-timer with a product. The person who's decided to be an entrepreneur, they decided what they're building and they've launched it, but they haven't gone full-time, maybe they're working a job already. Those are my three avatars, and then what I do is I find the 70% that's common across all three. So what are the 70% of pain points my beginner has, my part-timer without a product has, and my part-timer with the product. Because if I can learn the 70% of the common language, I can put out marketing messages, just one message, that'll apply to all three. Does that make sense? Hello. Um, Hello. I'm a fellow Penn Stater. My name is Simone Corbin. Um, thank you for your very um, uplifting presentation. I kind of want to know, this is a little personal, what was your biggest challenge in getting where you are now? I'm being a dorm student, I just would like to know that. And also, how did you overcome it? My biggest challenge, uh, it wasn't being ambitious. Uh, it was probably um, my biggest challenge. What a good question. My biggest challenge was actually deciding what not to do. 
because I have so many ideas, I have so many areas of interest, and in order to be great at anything, you have to have such a laser focus and be willing to say no to a lot of other things so that you can perfect that one thing. And what I say is, what I've learned is that if I can perfect that one thing, I'm going to learn strategies and techniques that I can then leverage to the next thing I want to do. So it was learning how to say no to things, and even myself, so that I could be focused and strategic. Like I use the example of um, Amazon and Jeff Bezos. Like, and has anyone ever heard of the flywheel? A flywheel, uh, I know some of my students do. A flywheel is a big, are you trying to get my attention? I'll be quick, okay. A flywheel is like a big metal contraption. It's like, imagine this is your business, this is your startup, and in order to get the flywheel going, you have to make an initial push, and then it's like, okay, then okay, push it again, and eventually this flywheel builds momentum and it goes. Like, if you think about Jeff Bezos and what Amazon is today, like, think about when it just started. Does anyone remember what it was? A book, it was online books, selling and receiving online books. It wasn't what it was today, but he was strategic. He learned how to, if I can just master selling books online and building trust with people that if you order something online, it will arrive to your house in mid condition within 48 hours. Once he got that right, then he started putting other products on his platform. He started lowering the price of those products. And then he was able to attract people who were uh, used to buying things in person, buying them online, and then he had so many customers, it created an influx of capital that then he used to make fulfillment centers. So he could house his own products now, right? And then on and on it goes, but it requires saying no. He couldn't build the Amazon that he has today from day one. You have to be super strategic about what you're optimizing for today and then how winning that game is going to set you up for the next level. Okay? So I had to learn that. Hi. My name is uh, Jeff Taylor, and congratulations. What a great speaker. I really enjoyed your presentation. And congratulations to Nia. I've watched her grow up uh, since about 12 years old. Oh, and Nia, so, round of applause for Nia. Nia. My, my question is for you. I, I saw your background. You came out as a sixth grade teacher. Um, I just came out of corporate America 30 years, starting my own thing. What was your aha moment to walk? I mean, and to really change complete cycles on yourself. Yeah, I was a, a sixth grade teacher in South Central. At the time, I was finishing up my last semester. I was about to enter a PhD program because I thought that was what the next level was. After I teach, okay, then I become a teacher of teachers. And I went to an event called Startup Weekend. Has anyone ever heard of it? Okay, it's like the original hackathon. You have 54 hours, you pitch an idea, you build a team, you build a prototype, pitch two investors. Um, that was my first entree into entrepreneurship. I've never taken a business class, never took a finance class, never took a technology class, but I, for the first time, was in an environment where if I had an idea, it wasn't like, okay, great, let's theorize about what this could be. It was like, no, let's build this shit. And I was like, what? I didn't know. And I was where I recruited business developers and developers and marketers, and we built a prototype in 54 hours, and we ended up winning first place in the competition. So for me, it was such an aha moment in this other world I wasn't exposed to about getting things done. Um, and I've never looked back. I mean, it was, it was literally, I was at this, this crossroads of, okay, do I go the traditional path of PhD because I work my butt off to get in the program, or do I pursue this venture now? And for a while, to be honest, I thought I was Superwoman. I was like, oh, I could do both. I could build a company and get a PhD. No problem. Um, and I was quickly humbled. It was so hard. And like I said before, I had to learn what to say no to and cut it so I could focus. And at that point in my life, I chose to take the dive and do it. And that was why I did it. But I oftentimes give advice to people, especially around finances. I'm going to be very honest with you. And I think Ramona's given a talk about this later this afternoon, so make sure you stick around for that. But the financial aspect of it was actually really hard for me. It's a part of the story I've told, so if you want to go on Medium and read my story. But I cashed out my credit cards, my retirement. My co-founder got his car repoed. I mean, it was not pretty. This is the reality. And so now I advise people on what I call saving up your junk jar, right? Your junk jar is like an entrepreneur's piggy bank. It's how much money you need to make the jump. And I say survive for at least three months. Because it's going to take you at least three months to actually build something that you could potentially either make revenue off of or that you can get a funder to invest in. So we're going to be having last two questions. 
Hello, thank you for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> so it's common knowledge that less than 10% of investment in new companies goes to women, and less than 1% goes to people of color. And I was wondering, based off of your presentation, that do you think that that is due to the black and brown community having a lack of empathy toward investors and funders, and so is that is that part of the reason? I think a uh, part of I think it's a great question. So Kipper Capital, we're actually one of the top investors in underrepresented founders, both women, African American, Latinx individuals. So your question, I really, really appreciate. So uh, if everyone heard it, it was about like is empathy is a lack of empathy the reason why people from underrepresented backgrounds aren't getting capital? And I would say no, that's not the reason necessarily. There are many layers to it, like bias, discrimination, sexism, racism, all sorts of isms that this country was built off of um, that actually play a role into how these decision makers who own the capital, mostly white men, have filtered through and created pattern matching systems for them to make decisions and figure like, oh, you look like the next Mark Zuckerberg, or you don't, so you don't really feel, fit our pattern. So there's many other reasons why, so I would never feel comfortable saying it's because of empathy, but I think that understanding their perspective and their psyche makes you more aware of how to play the game. And it always is a balance. I actually have a slide I do in another presentation about recognizing, this is in any situation, recognizing their norms and your norms. And I put it like on a scale. So it's up to the individual to decide where they draw the line. Are you gonna totally code switch and like move into like trying to make you look like Mark Zuckerberg, talk like a Mark Zuckerberg? Or are you gonna stay authentic to who you are, but also with the understanding of how they make decisions? So again, I can't answer that for any one person, but I think the awareness of understanding who these people are, what they think about, how they make a decision, can make you better informed to navigate it, for sure. So again, thank you for that really important question. Last question. Hi, um, my name is Renithia Williams. I'm over here. <laughs> Um, I am a CEO and founder of Invita. We are a professional development solution for millennials in transition. And since many of us here are either um, sort of hacking VC funding or trying to build without it, can you talk a little bit more about some of the themes that you had that were successful in recruiting teammates um, without actually paying them? Sure. So with, let me just preface this by saying, because you're not paying people doesn't mean you don't value them or not. you're not gonna pay them. So I'm not in favor of like taking advantage of people. That's like a hell no to me. Um, but there's, there's the reality of I didn't have the capital right now. So there's other things you can leverage, like Kelly mentioned, equity, right? A portion of your company so that you don't pay them cash out, right? But you give them shares of your company that if they invest, meaning that they have to stay on board for a certain amount of time before they become realized. So that's definitely one of the main ways. But at the end of the day, understand anybody you're talking to, your customers, your teammates, your funders, they're human beings. They're emotional, they want things, right? And every human being has the same three needs. They wanna know, do you see me? Do you hear me? And does what I have to say matter? Everybody wants the same things. And so with teammates, what I oftentimes do is get to know them, our people that I'm even trying to recruit. I'll just take them out for lunch. I'll listen to what they care about, where they've been, what they aspire to do. And as I learn more and more about who they are, and particularly what they aspire to do, I'll then check with myself and be like, can I offer them something here? So for instance, they've been working a nine to five corporate job and they feel limited, like there's a ceiling, and they're telling me they want to grow. I then present my value proposition as join my startup. This is a place where you're going to grow. You're going to be able to wear multiple hats. You're going to be able to be in a fast-paced, high-growth environment. You're going to be able to even hire people under you as we go. Right? So it's, again, taking the time to listen to what they care about. And not everybody's about growth. Some people are about money. Right? And you have to know that because then I'll know if there's a fit for where my business is at right now or if I'm wasting my time. Is that helpful? Yeah, let's give another round of applause. <laughs> Next up, we have Thomas K. R. Stowell. Um, 
I just want to take a moment to talk about Thomas because uh, he was one of my fellow EIRs um, with the Code 2040 residency. Um, based in Chicago, he leads one of the largest tech communities for people of color called I'm Black in Tech. Um, he also is the founder of Candid, which is a micro survey feedback platform. You guys might take it to try that out today. And um, he also gives amazing talks um, about how to think like a startup, which he's going to dive into a little bit today. Um, Thomas, I love because he always keeps me honest about if I am really focused on the things that I need to be getting done. As an entrepreneur, it's really, really easy to get overwhelmed with a laundry list of things that you're doing because you have to worry about this and that and this and this and that. You don't get to focus on just one thing. You have to focus on everything to make sure that things are happening and it's very easy to lose track of everything because you have to do everything. So um, he's gonna show you how to really just focus on the most important things and making sure that you're getting that done and holding yourself accountable to it. Without further ado, Thomas. Yes, I'll speak up a little bit. Is that better? Okay, good. All right, so let me just uh, set expectations really quickly about what we're going to cover. Number one, how to connect and engage on social media. So uh, my parents did a great job branding me. I'm literally the only Thomas K.R. Stovall online, like in the world. And you can check this out. I hope your parents did as well as mine did, but you can just find me at Thomas K.R. Stovall on everything. So Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, pretty much wherever, and also thomaskrstoball.com. And that's got a listing of all the projects that I currently work on. Um, I'm Black in Tech is my membership organization. You can connect with us on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and also at imblackintech.com. Um, how to stay engaged on social media, if you do care to tag the hashtags, uh, I'm Black and Tech, the organization. Intention mastery is what we're talking about today. So um, how to give feedback. What I do for a living is I work in the world of feedback. And I truly do care. Anytime I hit the stage, I want to know whether or not I hit the mark on what I'm promising. So at the end of this event, you're actually going to get an opportunity to respond to a one-question micro-survey and tell me whether or not uh, what I said actually made a difference today, and also, you know, what the key takeaways were. So everybody who's got a cell phone in here today, just raise your hand for me. This is great. So that's, that's called the setup. So I don't need you to download anything or sign up for anything, but take out your cell phone or on your laptop or on your tablet, just go to candidfeedback.com and bookmark it. Because at the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you a little seven-digit code for you to respond to a one-question micro-survey. We're going to turn the entire room into an instant focus group in 60 seconds flat. That's what I do for a living, but also use my product for myself. So I'm going to take about 10 seconds, take out your device, bookmark that, and don't do anything else. Then we'll move on. All right. Next, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of background. I don't know about you, but whenever I'm sitting in an audience, my first thought is, like, do I really want to trust this person? Do I, like, what makes them the person to speak about this? So 
I'm just going to give you a little bit about my background, and I'll let you determine whether or not uh, you're going to buy into what I'm selling today. So, a few wins, losses, and lessons. I've been in like I've been an entrepreneur pretty much all of my adult life. I do have an electrical engineering degree from Tennessee State University that I have never used. I started my first business out of my college dorm room in 19, and I actually have been employed for eight months in my adult life, and that's it. Uh, when I was 25, I got an opportunity to go out to LA and apprentice with a gentleman that ran a real estate private equity investment firm. And um, I took that knowledge and went back to Chicago, worked eight months to get $3,000 in the bank so that I could invest in real estate. And over the next 18 months, I turned that three grand into seven figures, investing in uh, working class communities on the south side of Chicago. Uh, what's more impressive is by the time I was 30, I lost all that shit. So, you know, literally, no credit, no money in the bank, a few million dollars of real estate gone, lost my dream home, and it humbled me. I have humility tattooed on my wrist, and it's for a reason. After you get used to, you know, having everything that you want to need, and it's just all taken away in an instant, you realize that you need help, you need mentorship, and it's why I'm really committed to mentorship so strongly today, is I knew that I could make money, but I didn't know how to keep it, that was for sure. And so I jumped back on the horse, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do now. After real estate, I transitioned into tech. What I do for a living, number one, I'm the founding partner of Candid, and as Ania mentioned, we crowdsource feedback. So uh, we call that micro-feedback, using one-question surveys, 160 characters or less, to crowdsource feedback for large enterprises like Diageo, excuse me, the largest manufacturer of premium wine, beer, and spirits on the globe, also for large associations, um, impact organizations. I do think tanks under my speaking brand called Think Like a Startup for large enterprises as well, like Clorox and CDW. And in 90 minutes, I go into organizations, and we take from their C-level executives all the way to non-skilled employees, put them together in the exact same room, and we identify directly from the mouths of the employees and the people close to the organization, the key stakeholders, what's working and what's not around one specific challenge that that organization is having and the, the one most important goal they've got over the next 12 months. And so everything is about laser beam focus. And you'd be surprised in an organization, your people already know what's working and what's not and what the solutions are and they're already talking about it. They're just not talking to you. And if you give people a safe space, they'll tell you what you need to know. And lastly, uh, I'm Black and Tech. We're a global membership network, <clears throat> excuse me, for founders and uh, professionals, mostly founders though, that are Black and Latino. And we've got 40 plus uh, members of 40 plus states, six countries, and the people that are on our network have raised and generated uh, over 415 million dollars in their startups. You've seen them on the cover of Black Enterprise. They've closed the largest deals in the history of Shark Tank. And it's all the way down to people that are trying to transition into tech, and they're like, "Look, I've, I've been a professional for 15 years, and I want to I want to start this tech company. What's this app thing, right?" So that's what I do. And who we've worked with, uh, you probably recognize some of those logos. That's a little bit about my background. So now let's get into the training. Uh, number one, you need to design your environment to actually account for your weaknesses. We're pretty much all built the same when you get down to it, our brains really operate the same. You've got to hack your brain. If you know the things that, that make a difference in, in, in most of us, again, we're built the same way, you just structure your environment so you account for those things. Community is really important. If you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to get anywhere, you're not going to get there alone. Period, point blank. It's a very long, lonely journey if you're trying to build something. You've got to get a group of like-minded people around you so they can support you with the emotional support as well as the knowledge that you need to get where you're trying to go. That's number one, is to have a community of people. We'll touch back about touch about more on that later. Number two, you need constraints. So I've got a lot of friends that are creatives, uh, artists, nationally recognized, and every one of them that I know that does really well, they actually carve out time every single week just to create. You can't find them, you can't contact them, they're not on social media. When they're creating, nope, nothing else gets in. Structure breeds creativity. It's really important to actually have constraints. And I know some of you guys, like, you, you don't, you don't want to do it, you got to have some structure. Number three, 
consequence. So I lead a, uh, a mastermind. It's a one-year mastermind. We got people from different cities that are part of it. Every single week we have a call. And every single, that's uh, every Monday 9 a.m. Every single week we've got a spreadsheet that's due with revenue updates and goals and things like that. It's due at 9 p.m. on Sunday. If you don't have your spreadsheet in by 9 p.m., 901 you get fined $50 for every single field in the spreadsheet that's not filled out. 9 a.m., you're not on the call, 901 you get fined $50. So there's constraints, there's consequences around what we're doing, and guess what? We don't really have too many people that miss that spreadsheet or late to that call. And we've been doing this for a year. So you gotta, you gotta create that environment that accounts for the fact that you probably don't feel like getting up. I don't feel like getting up every Monday at 8 a.m. to actually have that happen. But inside of our community, we've created that integrity by actually forcing ourselves to, to be inside of an environment where there's risk, there's threat of loss if we don't do it. Part two, focus on actions, not outcomes. Everybody wants to focus on what their revenue goals are and what their projections are, but if you actually dig into the actions, they haven't articulated exactly how they're going to get there. If you don't have a, an exact plan, you're probably not going to do it. If you can't see it, you can't say it. If you can't say it, you can't do it. Articulate your plan on paper, and you can actually get there. So inside of this thinking, I came up with a concept, language for a concept that all you guys know very well. I call it the Omni Gap. I trademark this. And the Omni Gap is the moment you define a goal, you also create a measurable gap in the actions that need to be taken in order to move from your current state to the desired outcome. This is omnipresent. If you create a goal, by definition, it is somewhere else other than where you're at right now. And there's a gap. Most people only look at the numbers in the gap. How much revenue do I need to generate? People don't actually articulate the actions that are in the gap. So we're going to talk about the omni gap today. Number two, build a transaction map for every product or service, document every single way that leads can get into your sales phone. And when I say every single way, I literally mean every single way. So I'll give y'all a snapshot. You probably can't see this again, so, but I just wanted you to see the structure. I use Asana for everything. So in Asana, I've got every business or project that I'm working on kind of listed there. And I literally have every single way that you can find out about me in that structure, in a funnel. Whether that's on stage, or we met on person with a business card, whether you found me on LinkedIn, whether you read a blog, whether it's from an email that I sent you cold, I've actually mapped all this out so that I can track how people respond in different areas. Some people just say, biz dev. Well, there's a bunch of different things. Did you call that person? Did you email that person? Was it cold? Was it warm? Was it, was it an introduction? There's so many different things that you can be tracking, and if you're not, you're kind of short, shorting yourself from understanding what's really going on. Next, you need to define your omni gap numbers. So what that means is, if you have a desired amount of revenue, you have to also know how many sales inside of your current term sheet, right? Your, your current term, contract, whatever. How many sales does it take for you to hit that desired revenue? How many contracts does it take to get that number of sales? Because as some of you guys know, Every time you get a contract does not mean somebody actually paid you money, right? So in my particular business, I don't do proposals. I do live demos, and if you'd like to move forward, I send you a contract, and then we actually move to fulfillment. I don't do proposals, like my terms are the same for everybody, so there's no need for a proposal. You say, yes, you want a contract, you get a contract, so I skip that. But for other people, they do have contract sales, and then for the number of contracts that you want, that you want how many live demos does it take you to actually get to a place of contract where somebody says yes, right? For the number of live demos that you need, how many invitations do you need out in the world for people to respond to? An invitation could be a post on Twitter. An invitation could be a direct email. An invitation could be a cold phone call. What I call anything that is a, you know, an opportunity for people to say, huh, I'd like to know more about that. That's an invitation. How many does it take? And when you actually start tracking all this stuff, you'll begin to see different percentages show up, and you'll know exactly what actions you need to take and how many of them to hit your desired revenue. So this is a snapshot. Uh, if you can see closer, at the top, 
I've got a revenue number over the, up there over a certain period of time. And once you hit the, the top line revenue, you break that down into the exact months that you have. So this is over five months. And then when you get past the number of revenue, uh, the revenue number for each month, you've got a number of contracts for that revenue number for each month that it would take to actually hit that. And then once you get down to the contract level, you've got a number of live demos for me that I would need to have in order to get that number of contracts because I know I close about 25% of the people that I actually do a live demo with. And once you have the number of live demos that you need for each month, then you actually look at how many, how many days do I have in each month that I'm looking at. So for August, if I started this on August 4th to August 31st, and took Monday through Friday, because people aren't necessarily responding on Saturday and Sunday, there's literally 21 days. And for September, October, November, and December, there were 22, 22, 22, 21 days respectively. So if I look at the 100 total um, invitations that I need to, a lot of demos that I need to have, and break that down, divided by the number of days each month, I can see that I need to make an average of five invitations per day in order for me to hit that revenue number that I've got for the, the whole time period. So. That's how you break down from revenue, down to number of contracts, down to number of live demos, down to the number of invitations. So if I'm focused on the most important thing, I don't have to worry about the revenue number, I need to worry about the actions. And if I can articulate the actions, then the revenue number becomes a foregone conclusion. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So that was one of the most important things for me to understand and transition it from like, wanting to build something to actually get into a place where I know how to generate revenue. I just didn't know how to articulate the actions. And if you don't know how to do that, get help with it. It's literally the most important thing you can do in your business is understand what actions you need to be taking over what time frame you've got to break it down. Oh, so number four is uh, to actually articulate these OmniGap actions. So document all steps for each transaction map to move prospects from invitation to money in the bank. So you can't see this, you can see the structure, but before I, lock, I, I showed you guys all the numbers. So I wrote down all the numbers I had to get to. Here are the actual actions. So for that first invitation email, for example, like what needs to go into that email? Who am I sending that email to? So up here I say the pre-word is to create a mix max email sequence. Some of you guys may be familiar with mix max, it's like an, autom an email automation tool. So my first action is to create an email sequence for a very specific person that's a conference manager in mix max. The second action is for that's that exact same person, it's a different type of sequence that has a different context to it. So I'm literally in my mind mapping out how do I want to reach out to these people? How are they going to respond? I'm going to try three different ways. The first way is talking about the product. The second way is saying, hey, I'm doing this thing called association relevance. I'd like to feature you on our Twitter profile. Can, can I get a headshot? So it's literally just different ways to say the same thing that get me into their funnel in a way that might be interesting to them. But they're all little tests. Then there's the actual prospecting. Now I've written the emails. Now I've got the context down. Who's going to send those emails out? How many do we need to send per day? Who's doing that prospecting? So I have an account with um, a tool called associationexecs.com that gives me a listing of all the associations in the country and their leadership boards, their actual email addresses and their phone numbers, so I know that I can get to my ideal client, but who's going to go and do the work to actually find those 10 names a day that I need and drop them in the, in the mix mix? That's something I need to write down. Those are the actions that need to take place. What are the planned outcomes? Out of a total of 106 possible days of outreach, I locked down that I would need to uh, have five association executives that were sent a communication each day, a minimum of 20 live demos per month, a minimum of four one-year license contracts per month, and one pilot contract per month based on my price points, to generate a minimum of 42,500 per month, and a minimum of $212,000 over the course of that time period. So that's the structure, but somebody's just gotta do the work. The planning is one thing, the execution is another thing. But you're not gonna execute anything if you don't first have a plan.
So the last piece of this is making it a foregone conclusion. I need to know that I need to reach out to five people per day. So how do I make that in my mind a foregone conclusion? I just double it. So if I know I need to make uh, reach out to five, I'm going to set my number to reach out to ten. And that way you actually exceed your goals from a planning standpoint. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? I just want to make sure I'm, we're tracking. I see a lot of hands not, that's good. Okay. Uh, just FYI, anybody who's on the team, let me know about how much time I have, because I don't have a timer right now. You got five more minutes. Okay, cool. So, uh, next step, this is just a, a quick snapshot of what an email might look like. I usually have super, super short, simple emails, and I'm a fan of showing instead of describing. So I don't describe what I do in an email, I literally have a live demo. And usually it's got their logo on a little image that says all I need is 10 seconds. This is how event managers all over the country are using our, our software to turn breakout sessions into instant focus groups. And it shows them how they can see it. And if they click that, they're going to see their logo in context of a conference they have coming up in real life. So that's another tool that I use, like show, show a set of tell. Next, once you've done this work, you want to rank all your sales funnels based on the length of time that you know it's going to take. So length, cost, time, and intangibles. Once you've done the work, you can kind of tell about how long it's going to go from invitation to close contract inside of your sales cycle. Because you'll start to see patterns show up. Next, you want to look at how much does it actually cost you internally to do this. I'm a fan of organic stuff. I don't like doing a lot of ads on Facebook and things like that. I like personal communication. So the, time, the cost is usually just the cost of my time or my team's time. But some people are a fan of like Facebook ads and things like that. If you actually have costs, you want to detail that so you know what your customer acquisition cost is. What's the actual time of the, the humans that are on your team that are doing this work? How long does it take them every day to put together these emails, to send things, to follow up, track that? The intangibles. Do you, do you like the way that this process works? Do you like one, one funnel better than the other? Do you just not like reaching out cold to people? That stuff matters to me. I hate cold phone calls. I, just, I don't think they're really effective. So I don't do them. So intangibles like that make a big difference to me. I like having warm introductions. So that's usually how I build my business out. So you're gonna rank all of these different funnels that you've got, and you'll start to see which ones are gonna be the best fit for you. And last, you're gonna prioritize your actions. So once you've got them ranked, you might have a ranking of one through six on which ones are, are actually by the numbers the best. Then you're gonna say, okay, well based on my current resources, Funnel number one, even though it would be the best, is have the Facebook ads, I only have $250 in my pocket. So I literally cannot do this, this funnel. I'm going to have to move to number two. So you now prioritize which ones make the most sense based on your real resources, the real people who you know, the real time that you have. Some of your team might be part-time, some of them might be full-time. They don't necessarily have the time to invest into funnel number one. You, you literally look at what you have and you make the best choice. So personal management structures, I'm going to go through this really quickly, just so you, you'll see visually what it looks like to manage my stuff. Um, anyone who I meet, I use Asana to kind of nurture that relationship and track where I'm at inside of that. So I meet people at other conferences, I've got met once, follow up needed, actively exploring an opportunity, next steps required, currently working together, or the timing's not right. And so I'm tracking like where, where I'm at in those relationships. I have what I call a master to-do list, an MTDL. That's for my personal stuff. So the MTDL holds all things that are, that are related to my business. It's like my, my master place for a brain dump. I do not have an idea that lives out in like some brain space, because it's wasted brain space. If I have an idea, it's associated with a business, I drop it into the MTDL, it's not time for me to schedule it right now, but it's tracked somewhere associated with each business. And I just keep track of everything here. My weekly action tracker is once it's time to take one of those MCDL items into real life and you know put a time and a date on them, I put them in here for ranking and prioritization with my daily and weekly uh, work. So I have moonshots, I have the work that's unscheduled, this is the work that's planned through Sunday, then I've got the stuff that's actually scheduled, the stuff that's been rescheduled because I want to keep track of how many times I'm saying I'm going to do stuff and then actually don't do it in real life, and then I have the work that's completed because from a, from a brain science perspective, it, it feels really good to actually look over in that column and see what you've been doing every day. See the stuff that you've been doing every week. 
because you need those small wins as a founder. This is what the prioritization looks like. I have high one, high two, high three, medium one, two, three, low one, two, three. And there's a definition for why something fits in one of those categories. High one is all money related. I've got to be sending an invoice. I've got to be sending a contract with us with them once one. I've got to be paying a, a, a bill that I need to pay. High two is related to like really, really top level biz dev of warm clients. And each one of these is prioritized different ways. But I keep track of stuff so I don't have to figure out what I should be doing next. I can literally look at how they're ranked and the highest level action that comes next just goes into my weekly calendar. So there's nothing for me to think about. Part four, team management structures. It looks very similar to my personal, except it's all focused on my team. So this tracks where the transaction cycle, number one, my master business of funnel, it tracks where we're at each opportunity. So we go from potential prospect to invitation to presentation phase to contract is out and I'm waiting on the invoice to be satisfied to contract sign invoice satisfied. Then we move on to fulfillment and then satisfaction measures, completion assessment, and last, inactive. So I didn't close something, but I want to keep track of what those opportunities were. Obviously, I'm not showing you guys everybody who I'm doing business with, but I'm showing you enough so you see some colors I'm going to put there on the board. Um, my team has to do list. This is where we keep track of all the design and development that's outstanding each week that we have to get done. And we have a master to-do list for that too. So this is a monthly mixer that we've got coming up on the 17th. And we had to get the flyer done, so like that's one of the, the, the action items that's in there, and we keep track of that. Uh, daily stand-up meetings with the team, super important. Every single day, quick 30-minute meetings to review what we've actually planned for the week, what got completed, what didn't get completed yesterday, what, what, what was actually planned, stuff like that. You want to keep that in front of you so you've got the big view, but you got the short view of what you're doing every day, and there's accountability there. Next, I've got um, the OmniGap actions and numbers. We've got a heat map. So like on our application page from Black and Tech, we literally look, it's nine pages, from page one to page two to page three, we know the actual attrition rates for how many people started on page one, where they click. You know, how many people move from page one to page two, day by day, week by week. So we change a word on one of those pages, we know exactly what impact that it had. And our close rate is extremely high that's been cultivated because we're actually tracking the numbers on every page that matters to us. Because the most important thing that you can do is know what action you want people to take. If you go to onblackandtech.com, like become a member is pretty much the only thing that's in your face. I don't care if you see anything else on the site until you actually engage in the way we want you to engage. Team weekly action trackers for ranking and prioritizing all my active projects. So uh, once a project that needs to get worked on goes into the queue, there's in Q through Sunday, stuff that's active and scheduled, stuff that's waiting on review, so some work has been done, I need to review it, I'm tagged on it, and I know I need to look at it. Once I look at it, are there any bugs or issues or updates that need to be issued, then I, I pass that back on to my designer, my developer, and last, the stuff that's been completed and approved, and then it's done. And last, and then we're gonna wrap up, you've gotta have a wolf pack. Y'all gonna hear me keep talking about this, you have to have a community. And this is the first year. I've been a, a solo entrepreneur for many, many years. In 2017, I'm really focused on creating what I call the wolf pack, which is other people that actually care about what you're doing. Right? They're on the same path, they're on the same journey, and they want to have other people around them to support them financially, emotionally. You know, sometimes it means having to having dinner and just checking in and knowing what's going on. Other times it's literally having them top of mind and saying, oh man. I just met this person, here's what they're doing, I think this will be a fit, can I make an introduction for you? But you gotta have people who are committed to what you're doing that you talk to every day. It makes a huge difference. And even if you have a small team, having those other people in your life will have you feel like you have a team. Long enough for you to get over them. Uh, lastly, uh, we, do a, we do a mastermind on Black and Tech that is one year, it's for people that are super, super committed to growing their business and it's happening uh, starting in November. So we already did one last year, and we're getting, to start up a, getting ready to start up another one for 2018. But uh, super, super important to make sure that you connect with a group of people that you know are connected with you and care about what you care about. So again, the best way to engage, uh, we are literally a global membership community. We have 13 different event series that support founders where they're at in their journey, whether you're 
uh, building something, launching something, already happening, already generating revenue, and you're looking to figure out how, how to blueprint and scale up, um, it's the best place to, to actually get that as a community. It doesn't matter where you're at. So, as I said earlier, I truly want to know whether or not uh, what I delivered today made a difference, and that you're left in a place that you can actually take some of this information and do a little bit better in your business, become a little bit more efficient. So take out your phone, we're going to take one minute for you to actually give me a little bit of feedback. Go back to candidfeedback.com, drop in that seven digit response code, and then we're going to wrap up. It's a cool beer, man. It's good morning, Mom. So that's that's my presentation. I don't know if there's any time for Q and A. I don't think so. But uh, that's it. Okay, good. We're gonna do a little Q and A. Right now, we are under half a million dollars in revenue, and sometimes when I meet other founders, they're so like revenue driven that it's hard. I mean, my experience has been to really get a group of people who can help you not only grow amongst each other but get you to the next level and kind of help them as well. So, what is your advice for finding kind of like these different groups of people who are kind of in the same place. I don't know, I'm based in New York, so I feel like everything is so huge there, but I don't know what your ideas are about that. Yeah, so when I, was, when I was starting my mastermind, I actually just looked deep into my personal network and identified the friends that I had that were kicking butt and taking names, and the people that were truly, you know, like, really cared about uh, stuff beyond just their own knowledge. Like, they were investing in other people. And I chose 14 people to reach out to, knowing that I wanted to have eight people in the mastermind. And I did it like I would do any other business opportunity. I detailed exactly what was going to be, be uh, included in that one year, like exactly what the expectation was, what the consequences were, like all of it. And then I had a webinar to actually talk them through my vision. And you know, from an emotional standpoint, to be able to what I was trying to create, let them know, look, I don't know if y'all have felt this, but I'm tired of doing this by myself. And they all felt the same way. And then you start just moving from intention over to commitment. Some of the people that were super excited, they started looking at their schedules, and they're like, yeah, I'd love to, but I just can't do it. Other people were a little bit nervous about the money aspect, because of the consequences. They're excited, but when they have to be held to account, like, look, you're going to pay a fine if you don't keep your word to yourself. Like, I don't know, check me next year. So you just do it like you would do any other business, but really focus on people that you know care about the same stuff that you care about. And I try to level up there as well. So the, the people that are on my network, some of them are at the same place in terms of revenue and things like that, but uh, I really search for the people that were like a few notches up so they can contribute in a different way to what I'm trying to do. Does that answer your question? So this is um, a, like getting, hi, getting um, maybe more practical to your tactical. I love how your project management and all that stuff is kind of dumped in one place, but I'm in a place where I'm trying to figure out how to fit everything in. Um, I'm in the, like, a little bit post beginning stages. I'm just starting to build a team that I'm like paying to work, um, but I'm basically doing a lot of it myself. I'm doing a lot of travel. Um, but I still have to execute on my product, and I'm still doing most of that work myself. So 
I love that you have like Asana. Asana has saved my life a bunch of times in addition to like Google Calendar, but like how are you going about chunking out your time? How are you going about um, executing on 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 the projects that you actually have to do? Is there a strategy that you can play for that? Yeah, so I didn't put this up here, but I actually break my day into what I call work time blocks. There's five of them. Okay. And in the morning five time blocks a yeah, day. Yeah, five time blocks. And it, it, it's actually only a total of <coughs> like five and a half hours, and after that I just kind of do what I want to do. But in the morning, your brain is, is most creative. Like that's when you're the freshest. That's the time when you should do creation-oriented work. So when you've got to do like a new type of, you know, presentation, something like that, like you do that in the morning, something that's brand new. And I usually have about uh, an hour and 45 minutes for my creation time block. In the afternoon, that's when I have two strategy time blocks, so like strategy business, stuff that requires me to sit and think and like, all right, so how should I format this email? I'm not creating something new, like maybe I'm, I'm editing or updating something, but it's strategy around like, who should I reach out to? How should I, like, what should the context be? It's that type of work. And then in the afternoon, at the end of the day, I have a completion time block that's uh, like your, your brain is dead, it's 5 p.m. That's best for rope items that are like, drop this off the mail, or follow up with this person, but there's no strategy that's necessary. You don't have any space to really think about this. So it's best to put that stuff at the end of your day where it's like you, you, you literally don't have to think. Does that make sense? That's awesome. Yeah, thanks. Can I say one more quick thing? Also, at the beginning, I focus on blueprints about Black and Tech, so there's like tons of different conferences and summits and, and events. Most of it doesn't matter. Because at the, end, at the beginning of your business, there's only a few things you need to know really well. You need to know exactly who your customer is. You need to know exactly how to find them. You need to know, need to know exactly how you're going to communicate with them. Period. And outside of that, there's not much else you need to be focusing on. So, you know, we set up all of our event series to focus on very specific tactical things in order. And most of it you just don't need until you've got real people who you're reaching out to and it takes no time to start calling people long before you build some tech. Like you don't need to build anything. Manually, reach out to people. You start like making some headway with talking to people, then you do something semi-automated, where maybe there's like some version of a first draft of a product that doesn't look all that great, but it accomplishes some goal, but you've got to actually be on the back end servicing something. Because inside of that manual work, you begin to see insights pop up that if you built the product first, you're going to miss a bunch of stuff and make assumptions, and it's, it's a waste of time and money. And long into the process, then you are. Could you repeat that? Who my customer is, how to find yeah. them, and what was the third thing? Who, who your, exactly who your customer is, exactly how you, like where you find them, and exactly the messaging that you're going to be using to, to reach out. So like, is that an email, is it a phone call, is it live face-to-face? -face? You need to break down what that actual structure looks like from that first invitation all the way down to, to contract. Yeah, okay. about how narrow they had to get to focus on who their first customer was. Like they were like, okay, we're gonna sell our product to bloggers and realize that that was too broad of a category. So they're like, okay, we're just gonna focus on food bloggers. And then that was too broad of a category. So they had to narrow it down even more to, we're gonna focus on paleo food bloggers. And then that was too much. So they're like, we're gonna focus on women paleo food bloggers. And that was when they started to really nail who they were selling their product to. And that was when word of mouth really started to take shape. And you would think that by narrowing it down, you're giving yourself too few customers to work with. But really, you have to do the practice and the work of understanding what is it that's important to your customer so that you can convert them. And then it's a matter of just replicating that and doing that over and over and over again. So I think that that was a really great uh, final note to end on too, Thomas. Thank you. Um, yeah. It's lunchtime, but before I let you go and tackle those boxes over there, um, 
I just want to let you know that we're trending on Twitter. Yeah. Okay. Keep sharing. Um, and then uh, also, I'm just curious to know, like, in terms of now that we're kind of through this halfway point of the day, um, I'd love to hear from people just like one thing that has surprised you this morning. Anybody want to volunteer a piece of information that you learned today that you didn't expect? Thomas? My mouth is super dry after that presentation. I wasn't expecting that. But um, I, I love the, um, the focus of, of what Mandela was talking about. I'm a very focused person, but just listening to somebody else share always brings you something new, no matter how deep you're, you're in an area. So it just reminded me it's really important to be in rooms like this, always, like no matter where you're at. Anybody else have one thing? Because of Thomas's um, presentation, I realized I need a lot of work with scheduling every item. So that is the first on the to-do list because I'm nowhere near as organized. So um, it's great to see that that needs to be done. Yeah, I told you guys, Thomas is the one that had me like, uh, I need you're doing too much. Uh, okay, cool. So uh, one other announcement that I have before um, we go to lunch is that we are going to also start having uh, office hour sign up. So tomorrow, we are going to have, in addition to a few talks, breakout sessions, um, which are going to be really, really awesome, a lot more like focused on different specific areas. There are going to be breakouts that happen over there. Um, and then we're also going to have this room lay out a little bit different so that people can get one-on-one -on -one time with people who are experts in their field. And so we have almost 40 mentors uh, that have signed up to sit down and have quality time with the people who are here in this room. So any of your most burning, pressing questions that you have, uh, or you just want to validate an idea that you have about a particular area, um, go over to our desk where the registration is. They're ready to start receiving people, and you don't have to do it right right now, but sometime from now through the end of the day, grab a slot uh, so that you can get a mentor office hour session tomorrow. Yes, you have a question. The hours, that's a great question. So we're going to have, um, the, the entire day will be 8.30 to 5 tomorrow. Um, the mentor office hour blocks will be from 9.30 to 11.30, 12.30 to 2.30, I'm trying to recall this off the top of my head, and 3.30 to 5. Yeah. And breakout sessions will be happening concurrently. Yes, Brianna. I have someone from our online chat, our live chat, who states, her name's Alicia. She says um, she has been surprised by receiving actual, I'm sorry, actionable advice and honest, honest acknowledgement of failure. Yeah, that's true. Keeping it real. We all keep it real. This group of people. Um, cool. Okay. So that said, let's uh, let's do lunch, and we are going to start with Danielle and generating revenue from day one at one o'clock.